welcome all of you to uh, the second annual uh, uh, lecture, uh, Arrow Lecture. These are lectures that are uh, given in honor of uh, Ken Arrow, who is uh, one of Columbia's most distinguished graduates. Uh, we hope all of you will uh, be of uh, equal distinction. Um, <laughs> The, last year was our first lecture, and it picked up on uh, discussing one of uh, Kang's uh, very influential articles uh, on uh, learning by doing, uh, which has really shaped thinking about uh, uh, technological progress and, and the evolution of, of economies. But today, uh, we're, we're talking about uh, uh, Kang's thesis, and those who are uh, 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 doing a PhD, this is a, a standard uh, which you should aspire to, <laughs> um, that uh, more than a half century after uh, your thesis is written, it is still an icon, it's, a, it's an inspiration, it's uh, something that really changed uh, uh, the way we think about the whole problem of social choice, and it uh, it was really, for those, those I, ho I hope all of you read it. it is, reading it is still a mind-blowing experience, that somebody could formulate a question like that is really, uh, is really amazing. And it shows you uh, a kind of creativity, which um, uh, Ken has continued. Um, he was here last night and unfortunately had to go back because of an illness, uh, because of a fall of his wife. But uh, he, anybody who engaged in discussion with him, uh, his mind is as sharp as it was when he was here at, at well, I don't know if it was this sharp, because uh, I didn't know him then, but, but, uh, uh, but it was uh, an amazingly sharp, sharp mind. Well, uh, today we have uh, two people who have done uh, enormous amount of work uh, elaborating on some of the ideas of um, that that uh, aspects of the field that Ken opened up um, more than 50 years ago. Um, we're going to begin with uh, Amartya Sen, uh, who uh, many of you uh, know he's been a repeat visitor. We've, we'd love to have him here more often. And uh, um, uh, I, I've known, I guess, uh, Amartya for, for more than 40 years. Uh, we met, met in England when I was a graduate student. Uh, he is now the Thomas Lamont University Professor and Professor of Economics and Philosophy at Harvard University. And uh, until recently was the Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. Uh, his research has ranged over a number of fields in economics, <coughs> philosophy, decision theory, and uh, made particularly uh, important contributions for social choice. Uh, in the theory of social choice, choice, which was cited by the Nobel Prize uh, when he uh, uh, got the, uh, when he was cited by the committee when he got his Nobel Prize, work in welfare economics, theory of measurement, development economics, public health, gender studies, moral and political philosophy, economics of peace and war. Um, Amarch and I just were uh, uh, together on uh, uh, working together on the committee. Uh, uh, Com International Commission on the Measurement of uh, Economic Performance and Social Progress that uh, President Sarkozy established that has uh, tried to, to translate some of uh, Marsh's ideas into uh, measurements. And earlier work, uh, many of you know the HDI, the Human in Development Index, that uh, has become a, a standard metric. Well, Marsha was the person who actually uh, ex ex so they called the UNDP, but it was actually uh, his work that really shaped, uh, created that index. So, uh, as I say, in 1998, he received the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics for his contribution to welfare economics. And uh, uh, just to plug his most recent book, uh, 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 The Idea of Justice, which I'm sure will be a little bit related to what uh, he's going to talk about uh, today. Mark you? He's going to talk just uh, for, uh, I hope, about 40 minutes, 40, 40, and, and then Eric is going to talk, comment, uh, but it's, 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 it's described as a comment, but it's going to be a talk of its own, uh, and, and, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, there you go. Um, now, 
I'm really, of course, tremendously um, honored to be giving this uh, lecture in, the, in honor of Kenneth Arrow, who has had a huge influence in not only thinking of myself and others, like including Eric Maskin here, but also really profoundly changed the subject of welfare economics, as well as economics in general. And it's the, what's called welfare economics, to which the social choice theory and Arrow's PhD thesis really belong. And it's that what we are going to celebrate now and discuss. And um, I will also try to uh, get on from there to other things that's happened because of Arrow's initial departure. Now, um, what happened in this PhD thesis that was written by Ken, um, it was, well, it's the 60th anniversary of the kind. When was it actually submitted? I'm not sure. Is it, is it actually 49 or 50 something? 50, yeah. It was certainly the first article was published in the Journal of um, um, uh, political con in, in 1950, and the book was 51. I think I think it must have been about. So it's just about 60 years since then. So exactly what happened? Um, well, there were three things that happened. The the context of the problem was welfare economics, but let's leave that for the moment. I'll come back to it in a few minutes. Uh, I better, since Joe has told me 40 minutes is what I have, uh, I better keep it here. Um, so, um, there were three things that happened. One was, and, and the three reasons for, as it were, celebrating Arrow's departure. One was there was a departure in the nature of social reasoning, using axiomatic methods, which has been used by logicians a lot, mathematicians, particularly dealing with the foundations of mathematics. And in a sense, that's how the subject of social choice got started originally in the 18th century, based on the works of French mathematicians uh, Marquis de Condorcet, in particular, but also others like Borda and a number of others who were mathematicians but interested in social issues. The, so the line of axiomatic reasoning that they used were far less systematic than the, uh, the way Kenneth Arrow placed it. Um, they, they had got a, in the 18th century, it was mostly 1780s, that they had got some interesting results, and one or two of them I might refer to. But the idea that having you have to construct a system in an overall way was to some extent partly connected with the air of mathematical thinking of that period. When I had to give a talk in a mathemat conference on the history of mathematics in Rome two years ago, I tried to relate, I won't go into it today, to what part these departure, including Arrows, but also Nash's and von Neumann Morgenstern's had, what connection it had with David Hill, um, uh, David Hilbert's discussion about the nature of, um, of um, engagement in mathematics, the, the uniformity of the subject matter and so forth. But that's too arid and formal, I'm not going to discuss that. But I am going to discuss something about axiomatic reasoning today, and, and that sort of animates the work. So it's a, it's a, it, it, people had talked about welfare economics, Figu had, Hicks had, uh, Dalton had, a lot of other people had, uh, Edgeworth had, uh, and Walrath, Wixell uh, had. But uh, there, was a, there was a departure here. Second, Arrow presented the framework for 
what he called social choice, which is how to choose between alternative states of affairs primarily, that was the nature of the approach, and that's quite important here, and derivatively on policies. Um, how do you go about choosing them? And what kind of conditions do you impose on that framework? So there was a departure in reasoning, axiomatic reasoning, departure in framework in terms of social ranking and social choice that's connected with ranking. And finally, the third point was a theorem. There was more than one theorem there, but one central theorem, so-called the impossibility theorem, which in some ways kind of um, was a kind of transformative experience for many people to see that something that looked um, a natural way to proceed leads to a apath of a gigantic um, 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 resilience and reach uh, seem scarcely unbelievable. And I ought to mention it, this is a, uh, oh, I just remembered, by the way, that I think I have not done this, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that this one, I don't know how to do it without some noise coming out. And, uh, well, actually, I now don't seem to know how to switch it off at all. <laughs> um, I, uh, I encountered that myself, actually, shortly before, shortly after the book was published. Our book came out in 51, I think in autumn. I was a student in Calcutta then, interested in, in economics and in math, but I had a classmate, a brilliant classmate, whom I often remember, like another brilliant classmate who had already figured indirectly, namely Mabu Bulhak for the UNDP Human Development, he was the leader. This is Sukumar Chakravati, who died many years ago. And he, um, he came one day to me and he said, you know, I'm reading a book, you'll find it very interesting, I think, given your interest on that. And that's how he first encountered the, as a, uh, you know, as having someone who has just um, arrived in, in, in this college and presidency. Um, in, 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 um, to, um, um, uh, uh, to look at the, uh, 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 that theorem. And it seemed initially totally, um, impossible. I mean, the impossibility theorem seemed to me to be an impossible thing to prove. <laughs> prove. <laughs> and now that things have moved on, we know how it works. All of us have different versions of the impossibility theorem, some of them very short. Uh, I think the claim that you can write it at the back of a picture postcard is true, but it's not all the claims here are true, because some of them are not independent results, they're derivative on other mathematical results. That's cheating, because Arrow's work is completely elementary. It assumes nothing other than Kind of think like piano's axiom, like you can count <laughs> and that kind of stuff. But it has become, but it was really quite a complex thing. Of course, the proofs have improved over the years. They're all drawing, drawing on the major insight of Ken. But it's a, uh, it was a staggeringly um, unbelievable, astonishing theorem. So let me comment a little bit on that, but this is the moment to come back a little to the context, the historical context. Arrow is writing in the 40s, late 40s. He's working in the Carl Foundation. He is interested in welfare economics, among other things. And the welfare economics is in absolute turmoil. Everything was going on a, a happily chugging along, along utilitarian rails. It was an utterly vulnerable rail because utilitarianism as a philosophical approach is so um, uh, fragile that's amazing that people felt so secure on it. But it didn't get secure, it didn't get questioned on grounds that 
why just utility? Why not other things like freedom, liberty, and why not this or why not that? But instead of that, the question was, well, in order to use utilitarianism, you have to sum utility, but can you actually compare utility of one person with another? When you think of it historically, this burst in the 1930s, it was a, not only an implausible dispute, because, uh, you know, we know that comparison of well-being of different persons is not easy to make, but to say that the whole thing is incomprehensible seemed rather absurd, and it's particularly incomprehensible be bearing in mind this, the time. In 1930s, depression, soup kitchens, to be able to say, I can't tell between some people being being better off than others in terms of happiness. So, I mean, see, if there was a time, there wasn't a very well-chosen time <laughs> to make that point, I would have thought. But then again, it was made at that time. And it has a kind of amazing currency, partly because, I mean, the economists very rarely recognize how parasitic the subject has been, even people who don't have any interest in philosophy, on, on philosophy. And, of course, these were the days of, of positivism, logical positivism, as one branch of it is called. And all these things seem meaningless statements. And, of course, the best of the people who are doing it later express how basically flimsy the exercise was. I remember A.J. Eyre, who was one of the great exponents of that, being interviewed by McGee, telling on the television when, uh, about when McGee was interviewing philosophers, saying, so what do you think? Why are you so unhappy with your work in that phase? And Freddie Eyre reflected on that question for about three minutes, after which he broke his silence. But she saying, because... What I said was mostly, almost entirely wrong. <laughs> well, that seemed a pretty definitive reason for being <laughs> um, discontented. But anyway, that was the thing. People can't compare their utilities. Now we are in a real mess. You're still utilitarian, summing utilities, but you can't compare utilities. So you could say very little. Just when everyone's utility goes up, you could say, well, some total must have gone up. No comparison is needed. But if there's one guy somewhere whose utility gone down, you know, then it's different. Or the other way around. Everyone's utility has gone down, but one guy has got up. Emperor Nero has just <laughs> been playing fiddle while Rome burned. We can't say anything, because Nero was better off. Everybody else was worse off. How could you make such a judgment? I mean, don't be arbitrary, etc. So that was the thing. So it was really a kind of total impasse, and there were people were um, making um, um, statements about welfare economics, sequence of them, which Wil Wilfred Baumol would later recognize that every new contribution to welfare economics sounds more obituarial than the last. And, well, then the most obituarial <laughs> came from Ken. Uh, and what he did, he took this seriously. I think he actually himself believed in it. This has been um, uh, difficult to think because of the fact that he was also, unlike most economists, interested in philosophy. But he did. And so he was not going to make utility comparison, but he was still pretty wedded to utilities, and he was going to sum them. And then, of course, you could use very relatively little you certainly couldn't say anything much about inequality. But then there are other things. Now, how far can you go in this framework? That's the question he was basically asking. Suppose everyone's preferences, everyone has preference. Now, there's, this is not going to be a formal thing. I see that Eric is preparing for um, um, a, a PowerPoint. Are you preparing? Your PowerPoint doesn't have one, the basic social welfare function. There's R as a function of R1 to Rn? Okay. If I were to write it, can people re see it? Okay. <laughs> now that we are economizing on, in Harvard because of our financial crisis, <laughs> uh, it's very nice to see that chalk is available. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. 
when biscuits have become, we have dis disappeared from the <laughs> So, this is the ranking of all the alternative states of effect from which ultimately policies will be chosen. And it's a function of everyone's ranking of all those states of effect. Okay? And they are end people. Um, now, that's what Arrow called the social welfare function, that F, that gets you a social ordering based on individual ordering of the states of the press. That's the framework that he presented. There is a, more generally, it's a connection between the individual uh, assessments, values, and he was quite clear, preferences he took broadly, not just self-interest, everything that goes into it, everything considered just judgment, against, uh, about the states of the press from which you arrive at social, uh, social ranking, and he imposed certain conditions on this, respectful of no interpersonal comparison, respectful also that our social ordering should be an ordering, should be transitive, complete, and well, reflexive is straightforward, namely that X is at least good, as good as itself. My friend Bob Nozick used to describe it not as a rationality condition, but as a sanity condition. <laughs> but there are a rationality condition too, like transitivity and so on. And so with that, he imposed certain axioms, which seems plausible, and he got into a problem. And one is unrestricted domain. These are not his. There's slight variations of the axiom. I'm following my presentation of Arrow. <laughs> but I think it's easier. And I've seen, since I've now seen Ken doing the same, I, I feel that I've, I've got the, what is it called? I've got the autonomous authorization. There's a seal on it. I can do it. So I'm going to take the domain and say, please always do any order. You don't say, no, 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 that, you can't really order things like that. No, no. Then there's a condition called Pareto principle, which is very familiar with economists. Too familiar, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and that says if everyone prefers X to Y, then society must put X above Y. Then there's another condition called independent, which says if you're ranking X and Y, you look at individual preferences only over X and Y, not over irrelevant alternatives. Now, that's not the way Arrow did it, because even though Arrow if this is relational, he actually had a hybrid system. He put in a choice function here. But you can move from one to the other, and I'm just translating this simply. And the condition I'm using is an implication of what he demanded, but doesn't actually mean everything that he demanded. I say that is a slight generalization. And there's a condition of dictatorship, non-dictatorship. There shouldn't be a guy such that whatever he or she prefers X to Y, society must put X above Y. Well, all these seem plausible, and he showed that these together cannot be satisfied. That seemed possibly here. And that seemed quite <coughs> stunning. It did seem to me very stunning in 51, 52. <laughs> and I think it is stunning. Now, so that was the impossibility theorem. Now, then the question is, what are the implications how do you do with it? There's first the question of interpretation. So let me spend a little bit of time on that. The interpretation that is common, I think is somewhat misleading, is that Condorcet, already in 1780s, had shown the so-called voting paradox, which means that X could defeat Y in a majority vote, while Y defeats Z in a majority vote, and Z defeats X cycle. And it's thought that while that showed that majority vote cannot generate a ranking R, I will generalize it to show that it applies to all the choice mechanisms of that class, of the voting class. Now, that is right and wrong. 
right in the sense that, yes, indeed, at some stage you get to that point. But it's wrong because you're talking about voting mechanisms, and we started about welfare economics. That's not about voting. People wouldn't say majority decision as a plausible way of getting to a welfare improvement. Take all the poor in New York and half their incomes and give it to the rich. And if the number of poor is less than the number of rich and com comfortable, you have made a majority improvement. Or if you really want to be extreme, take the poorest and cut his or her income and give it to somebody much richer, divide it a number, a number of them, you made a majority improvement. Well, that can't be a welfare economic improvement. So we are in the wrong territory. The main force of the Arrow theorem lies in getting to that territory. And by that time, by the time Condorcet comes in, the bulk of the proof is in fact over. What is shown is this, that even though you're trying to make um, welfare judgments, since you are confined to this space where there are only preferences, the only way that you could take into account differences between the rich and the poor would be, since you can't make interpersonal comparison of utilities, would be in terms of telling between the rich and the poor, as described, like, um, you know, who has how much money. Well, the first part of the theorem that Arrow established was to say that if everyone's preferences over x, y is the same as everyone's preferences over a, b, not, no matter what x, y, a, and b are, then if x is preferred to y, then a must be preferred to b, which means it doesn't matter what they are. That's the big lemma, as it were, which gets you to the voting territory. Once you are in the voting territory, you are in a different ballpark, and then all this comes in. So that was shown in a, and, and that is really the most difficult, I mean, even in 51, I knew something about Condorcet, but I didn't know why a welfare economic problem would be like a voting problem. Basically, he showed in the absence of interpersonal comparison, the welfare economic exercise, if formulated like that, and what if not, what else, will be a voting problem. By that time, two-thirds of the proof is over, and the rest of it is to generalize, as if we the majority paradox. There are a lot of interesting things on voting, and no one knows as much about it as Eric Maskin. And I think you're going to talk about voting, yeah. So we're going to get, so I'm, I'm going to avoid that subject now, because of that, it will be covered. But there's a lot of interesting things, but the interesting thing from earlier prediction, before you get to voting, is that we have thought in any way discriminating between the rich and the poor. You can't say the rich is better in utility than in poor. You say, no, 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 that's interpersonal comparison. You can't say, like the utilitarian might be perhaps, that, that the poor would get more from a bit of income than the rich would lose. You can't say that. It's interpersonal comparison again. And you can't say the rich have more cash and more wealth than poor have, because that means you have to look at the content of X and Y and A and B. But that theorem, which is sometimes called neutrality theorem, is in fact neutrality between the content of the state of affairs has been shot. That's where the muscle of the proof, in fact, is. So once you've got that, you then arrive there. So I, it's, in a sense, generalization of the Condorcet paradox, but the bulk of the proof is to show that you are in a situation where the Condorcet paradox is actually relevant, because it's all going to be voting ultimately, given the interpersonal comparison absent and so on. Now, my way of understanding it, since I always thought it extremely implausible to rule out interpersonal comparisons, was that I thought that Arrow might go from there. Of course, you know, I was on hindsight, I was reading his work, would be to say that, therefore, 
with interpersonal comparison being banished, you either have a choice of that get out of utility and make comparison of something else, or allow interpersonal comparison. This idea of having utilities which are so maimed that you can't make interpersonal comparison seems an awkward way of getting started. But that was not what he did. He actually wondered how to deal with it, because by that time, I think Ken Arrow had become very interested in voting theory also, though he had got there only from welfare economics. Um, those who were welfare economists actually didn't take Arrow's thing seriously. I've, one of the persons that sequentially both Joe and I were successors of John Hicks <laughs> in, in Oxford uh, in the same position that we, he, he held. I tried to get John Hicks to say what did he think about Arrow. I couldn't get him to say much on this. Eventually I found an unpublished paper which was eventually published when we did a collected work together. But earlier on I went and he said, no, no, I will do something about that. Uh, I didn't know him very well, I wasn't in Oxford, but I saw him in, in meetings. And then he said, no, there's a new book coming out. I discussed something about Arrow. The new book came, he sent me a copy, I opened it. Couldn't see anything on social choice. And I thought, gosh, he, I can't get him to comment on this. And then eventually I found an index saying, Arrow. So then I, my hope rose and I looked at the next, how the indexes proceed. The index said, Arrow, comma, the moving. It was about Zeno's paradox. <laughs> so there went my, any hope that he was going to address that. But he actually didn't, because he really did, and Samuelson is also had said that, this ain't economics. This is all mathematical politics. But you see, the point of Arrow was to say, if actually you are in this framework, then mathematical politics is what you have to do. Now, for me, that would be an argument to be not in that territory. But if you took that seriously, which Ken himself did, then it raises the question, how do you get out of a dilemma? So I think that here's two things to think about here. One is, how do you get out of this dilemma in welfare economics? And second, how do you get out of this dilemma in voting theory? Because welfare economics may not be voting theory, but voting theory is of independent interest. So, if there is a Condorcet paradox, and if there's an arrow generalization, what do you do? Now, I want to mention this because I'm often credited with having resolved, and indeed the, the Nobel Foundation also mentioned that, uh, that having uh, way, ways of getting around the arrow problem, but it has to be emphasized for welfare economics. Because my main method was that you can use interpersonal comparison, would be utilities, I would be ambitious and use freedom, I'd bring in rights, that may generate some other uh, impossibility theorem. It became very easy to make impossibility theorem there. I produced that theorem called the impossibility of the Paratian liberal, and for this four-page paper I was greeted with 650 responses within three years, and it sort of terrified me as to how much of a fashion we were all in at that time. But while that was an impossibility result, giving priority to rights in a certain way is another way of talking about it. We have to drop one important condition, namely completeness of R. Not so much the ordering aspect, but the completeness aspect, because some of the things you may not be able to resolve. And that it would be the way to deal with welfare economics, I still think it is. Um, this book of mine, which was being very kindly displayed by Joe, uh, The Idea of Justice, is an attempt to use social choice theory as an approach, constructive social choice theory. I'm basing it not on any possibility result, but possibility result. My Nobel lecture was called The Possibility of Social Choice. And it was, there are different ways of doing it. But we would, might discuss one or two of them right now. But the other is, what about voting? That issue has to be engaged. I'll leave it mostly to Eric, but on the other hand, I ought to say a few things on that too. So how do you deal with it? Well, first is to shoot the um, 
suspects that might take you in the wrong direction. The usual suspects don't work here. Um, we explored all of those lines. Ken Arrow himself started that by saying, well, if individual preference, if you drop unrestricted domain, if individual preferences have certain pattern, he called single peak, then you will still, then you will be able to have consistent majority decisions. But that raises two different types of problems. One is that, well, individual preferences may not take single peakness. How far can you go? That made me work on generalizing it first, and then along with a very brilliant student of mine in Delhi, Prashanta Patnaik, arrive at necessary and sufficient conditions. What do you need for that? And um, later that problem was extended in a different direction by Gromor and others. But it turns out, and that's the first problem, that even when you take the necessary conditions, they're much broader. They may cover 20 times the space of Ken Arrow's single peakness, but still, they're extremely unlikely. If that's the way our strength lies, we are not very strong. In fact, one simple way, that's not a way of anyone's preference is determined. If you assume every preference of any individual as likely as every other, as you go on increasing the number of alternatives, the proportion of necessary conditions satisfying things becomes measure zero. It really is not there at all. It may work in many cases, but that's just good luck. But the second problem is more serious from an economic point of view. I always think that it was wonderful that the impossibility <coughs> theorem came, because given the fact that economists love consistency, and if consistency goes through, then don't want to worry about that, about anything. I noted that even my Nobel citation said that I followed a consistent approach. So I think I thought, in a sense, I was getting credit for something which I didn't really regard that to be very important. On the other hand, I mean, I like being consistent, quite frankly. But uh, what I mean is that it's not a very high virtue. I mean, it's kind of minimal virtue. Um, but if majority decisions were perfectly fine and transitive, then you would be in a place where anyone's minority rights could be violated because majority wants opposite. There goes liberty. There could go inequality, not in a kind of Karl Marx world where the working classes and the, and the capitalists may have, not Karl Marx world of, of, of serious books of Marx like Capital or 18 Brumaire or Louis Bonaparte, but Communist Manifesto, the simple pamphleteering of Marx, two classes, workers and capitalists, where workers have nothing to lose other than their chain. They are more numerous than capitalists. They will win any majority decision. That's, by the way, very single peak. And you will get perfectly fine solution there. But if the poor happen to be small, as they often are, and their interests often go differently, the uninsured in America, 45 million, a lot of people, but the minority who don't have medical insurance, a lot of people who are really ultra poor and don't know where the next meal is coming. 49 million people in the last report in America indicates have food insecurity. That's minority. And if majority decision is all you wanted, that welfare economics would be a very different creature from anything that got people interested in social welfare at all. So it was wonderful under the circumstances that the impossibility theorem emerged because consistency was impossible. You couldn't even argue that since it's consistent, let's use it. That's not a good argument at all. But since I always fall for it, well, many people fall for it, it's tempting to kill it then and there, and it got killed. Now, so what do you do? Well, you can broaden the interpersonal comparison. One of the, well, the, sorry, I was talking about usual suspect. Another one where I disagreed with Ken, and it took me some, quite some time to persuade him, that actually that R, that he called it collective rationality. 
that actually it's redundant, in fact, in the theorem, as it happens. Because, you see, the R has a characteristic, and it comes only indirectly from the restricted domain, which the other conditions don't have. It is how the preference over one pair relates to preference over other pair. Transitivity says, if you prefer socially x to y, and socially y to z, then x must be socially preferred to z. It's a different kind of condition from how do the individual preferences relate to social preference. Take Pareto. What's it saying? It's nothing like the transitivity. It says if everyone prefers x to y, then society prefers to x to y. It's a relation between social individual preference and social preference. Similarly, non-dictatorship. There is not a guy who, whenever he or she prefers x to y, society prefers x to y. No relation between one pair or another in social preference or social choice. It is a relation to between individual and social, and similarly independence. Ranking of x and y depend on individual preferences only over x, y. So it's only unrestricted domain demanding transitivity in the class of R. Can you relax that? And the answer is basically you can. I'm not going to, you will be happy to hear that I'm not going to try to generate the theorem. Anyone who is interested in the mathematics of the theorem is, can look at a paper of mine, Econometric uh, 1993. It's called Internal Consistency of Choice whereby you could drop the internal consistency thing and the arrow impossibility theorem still holds. You, lead to, you lead to think, need to tinker a little with the, the other conditions, but within the same motivation in order to make that redundant. So I think Arrow, I personally think, overestimated the role that collective rationality plays in his theorem. But you know, <laughs> bearing in mind this is his PhD thesis, I mean, it's amazing what ground he had covered and naturally standing on his shoulders. I think we could see a lot further than he, when he was constructing it, did. Um, the, the other thing that is often people, I mean, there are lots of other ways of saying, well, what about non-dictatorship, what about independence? I don't think any of these are fruitful grounds. So basically, since you can have that R, and if you replace it by choice function, and the choice function have a reasonable connection with individual preferences. Choice function meaning, give me a set and I will tell you what to choose from there. Give me another set, I'll choose, tell you what to choose from there. Give me still another, I'll tell you what to, that's a choice function. For every set, every menu, it picks one or more choosable alternatives. So if you had the, instead of R you had C, choice function, and had similar kind of relation with the individual social preference, you have a similar result to arrow. Now, what you need, therefore, is to put more into this R1 to Rn. And if you have interpersonal comparison, of course, you get immediately out of that kind of problem. And there are plethora of ways of doing it. You could use utilitarianism. You could do some kind of egalitarianism in the space of utilities. You could do many other things. You could um, combine them, and they have nice axiomatic structure. We're all using the same framework of axiomatic reasoning, and essentially the same framework also with these variations. I regard that as arrow framework. I call this social welfare function null, since the, instead of R1 you have functions, and then the choice function becomes a function of the function. For those who are interested in all these niceties, <laughs> it becomes a function now, therefore. But uh, basic motivation is the same as ours. So with that, you can really go long distance within axiomatic framework. One of the neatest of utilitarianism axiomatizes that by Eric Maskin in the Review of Economic Studies, if I remember right, 68 or something. 78, sorry, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm making him older than he is, yeah. Uh, so I think we, there are other ways of doing it, and similarly in this book, um, Idea of Justice, which is a social choice based thing, since I take freedom quite seriously, and there are ways in me. My first arrow lecture, this is my second arrow lecture. My first arrow lecture was in 1990, on his 70th birthday, I think, and it was in Stanford. 
And that was about axiomatization of freedom rankings. So with that, you can go some distance, apply it, social thing, and the theory of justice is, in fact, the book, The Idea of Justice, is very much concerned with applying that approach rather than the social contract approach of, of Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and, and Kant and today Rawls, Dworkin, Nozick. They differ from each other, uh, but um, have a contractarian framework at the, um, as a behind them. Now, so that's one direction to go, basically informational enrichment. What about the uh, voting problem? Well, that remains, because in some ways, I mean, you might take into account, I mean, it depends on what you're looking at. That is, if you think votes take into account people's intensities and who is better off and who is worse off in a public debate, then, of course, you're getting to the similar territory. And it's quite clear that Marquis de Condorcet was very keen on public reasoning exactly for that reason. And he thought that these issues of inequality will affect people's vote. And that, of course, mathematically he didn't pursue it, but you can see that that's the direction he was seeking for a solution. <coughs> I have to say, even though, you see, when I was president of AEA, when I gave my presidential address on social choice and public choice theory, public choice theory has appeared to many social choice theory as basically a, a right-wing irritant on the flesh of social choice. Uh, but it turns out, actually, that James Buchanan, who is one of the great economists of our time, and the originator of public choice theory, actually took, rather like Habermas, enormously seriously the dialogic consensus-based politics where you take into account people's gain and losses in a bigger way, which in the second round leads to consensus and leads to a kind of voting. So there is a connection between Condorcet, Habermas, Buchanan, and public choice theory, and if you don't regard it as, I mean, as a thorn, it's thorn only when it's used for extremely right-wing causes, namely you don't make any reform unless everybody agrees to it, which is really not a good way of doing it. Uh, but if you see that general thing, there is some kind of a solution. So I tend to think of the voting theory in the context of these kind of exercises as being some extent derivative on the welfare economic exercise we are doing, since that is a big part of the political debates that you happen to have. On the other hand, there are a lot of other voting problems. Um, Ken Arrow told me that once he was asked in Stanford by one of the societies there as to, we had to have an electoral method. We all have to do it. When I was president of the Econometric Society, I remember we had a voting, a whole committee dealing with voting rules. And I did mention that as, a, as someone who had been doing impossibility theorem, this is a rather difficult task for me to do. <laughs> but we, we did it, but we make compromises. We say, well, you see, that's the great thing, and that's my last point I want to say. The great tribute of the axiomatic reasoning is this, and which is why I remained an axiomatist, as it were. Not that I don't know its limitations. Sometimes the axioms are far from clear, in the sense that you know what it is, but when you combine them, they become a kind of dynamic which you didn't. And the reason for it is quite simple, by the way. That is, when we say yes to an axiom, we can't think, we don't think absolutely abstractly. We think of actual cases. And it may be that those cases work fine, but there are uncountably many cases in the world. And that's why these theorems are important, because you generate an impossibility <laughs> result and suddenly these axioms, which look like a little bit of a tame little snake lying, lying at the one corner but not biting anybody, standing up like a king cobra trying to hit you on the head. And that you wouldn't get without the axiomatic method. So that is ultimately a tribute, an axiomatic method critique of relying on one-shot axioms. That, by the way, also comes in in the theory of justice in my book, because quite a lot of the theories are really one-shot affairs, and that reduces the role of public reasoning. You have a set of rules, whether it's laws or, or 
music or walking, he arrives at some kind of a mechanism for insurance markets in a state of ignorance. And like many non-economists, is completely confident about the magical properties of the perfectly competitive market, that the equilibrium exists, they are unique, they are stable, and you can get there. And also that you understand what it was doing. And alternative approach, which would be part of the use of the axiomatic approach, and that's part of the thing I'm also arguing, that you will arrive at some results that look, yes, it look like ju just, but what kind of a world does it create? I make a distinction between two Sanskrit notions, niti, about just institutions, and naya, about how people's lives go, the justice of that. You have to always assess niti in the light of naya, and the way to do it in terms of your theory is, of course, the axiomatic method. The niti then becomes becomes the axioms and see what kind of results emerge from it. So that is, I think, the huge merit of it. But the last merit with which I was began referring to when I went on to the slight dig digression is this, that even we know that we are not going to be able to satisfy everything that we want from a voting mechanism, the fact is that we can then identify these are the conditions we would not satisfy. There are other things we do satisfy. You have your pick. I'll pick the I gotta rank all the method, thereby going against one of his axioms rather than another one of them. And so we all have that, but at least we are in a kind of well lit space as to what we are doing. So I think to just to conclude, I would say the axiomatic reasoning was totally constructively a major game-turner, a transformational notion. And it came then, of course, in the theory of value, Gerard de Vaux and others came in. Arrow himself was working on another problem then on the market economy the same year, 51, saw it, an article of him on that subject. It's a game-turner, but the only catch, I would, I've only addition, I would say, you have to use axiomatic reasoning to be critical of one-shot axiom choice. Secondly, it gave him framework of social choice, which is, I think, robust, which is important, at least robust enough for me to posit it as an alternative to the Hobbesian, Kantian, Rawlsian, Dawkinian, Nozickian, uh, Negelian approach. Um, but in a broader, broadened form, R may have to go R1, R2, to have more information, but still basically relation between individual valuation and the appropriateness of, of, of social decisions. And finally, the impossibility theorem. That was a stunning result in its old form. It is open to further generalization that may darken the gloom a bit. On the other hand, it's also the case that it lightens the gloom by telling us that you really have to rethink on this subject. People have ended up somewhere that they shouldn't, in fact, have ended up being there. That is, if you are really going to rely on utilities, for God's sake, you do need interpersonal comparison. Or else think about other things, not just utilities. So I think the, all three of them are really major constructive contribution. The impossibility theorem because of its elegance, drew much greater attention than the other two, the axiomatic method and the social framework. I would say in the long run, I think all three of them are major contribution. And as Joe said, to think of all this coming from the PhD thesis, which all of you were invited by Joe Stiglitz, if I heard him right, to, to emulate <laughs> immediately, uh, it's absolutely astonishing. So on that note, I stop. Thank you. Thank you.